production of Being Well is made possible in part by Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Rediscover Paris. Our patient care and investments in medical technology show our ongoing commitment to the communities of East Central Illinois. Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center. HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, delivering compassionate care close to home. From advanced surgical techniques and testing to convenient care for your family, we promise to make a healthy difference each and every day. St. Anthony's, together we are better. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of Being Well. I'm your host, Keanne Armstrong. And today we're going to be talking about something that affects females in all different ages. And joining me today is Dr. Arturo Menchaca with uh, Paris Community Hospital, and you are a urogynecologist. That's correct. So this is a subspecialty of gynecology, is, am I correct? You're correct. Uh, it's a subspecialty of both gynecology and urology. So after you do a residency in each one of those, then you do additional training to become a urogynecologist or a female urologist. Okay, so going a little bit deeper, like what parts of the female do you treat? Uh, the gynecologists usually deal with the female reproductive organs, that's the uterus, the ovaries, uh, the female pelvic floor, the vagina, the external uh, uh, area in the vulva. Uh, urogynecology involves also the anterior part of the pelvis, which involves the bladder, the urethra, and the posterior part of the pelvis, which involves the intestines. Okay. So we're involved with the whole pelvic floor. All right, so that's a lot more than what a gynecologist, that's where it comes in, where you need the extra training and so forth. Correct, yeah, so that's an additional three years of training on top of the four years of gynecology. Okay, all right. Well, I'm sure that there's lots of different things that you treat then. So let's talk about some of the different um, ages that you treat and some of the different things, the different conditions that come along with that. I usually start treating uh, females because that's most of what I treat, uh, uh, starting probably from around 10 years of age. I've done surgery in young girls that are about 10 years of age up to 90 in the 90s, 95. Range so I see all all the uh, women in between those ages. Right, a wide range. A wide of range. Ages. Yes. Okay, so if they if we start at age ten, is this surgeries? I mean, have they started their period yet? I mean, what? Well, is there's girls that start their periods when they're eight, eight or nine. Goodness. Depending on their weight, you know, the heavier girls start periods even as early as eight. And if you have certain problems, of course, you start your periods, the ovaries wake up and they start producing uh, eggs and you may have problems with cysts, you may have problems with pelvic pain, problems with bleeding. So even young girls have issues of that type of uh, problem. Uh, and of course, you go through the teens, the 20s, 30s, and then you go through menopause in your 50s and then you end up with other problems. Mm -hmm. And then as we get older, you know, men and females, you, we start coming up with the problem of cancer. So then I also deal with that issue, with cancer. Uh, women in their 20s and their 30s, they may have problems with bleeding, problems with fibroid tumors, problems with infertility. Mm -hmm. So all of that I see in the clinic. Okay, well let's go back to, let's talk about the 10 year old and you said a surgery. What type of surgery would you do on a 10 year old who's having some difficulties? Well, you may have a cyst uh, that may be in the ovaries that are not going away. Uh, whenever you have a cyst in the ovary, if it's large enough and the girl is very active, you may have what we call a torsion that it twists on itself and then you have an emergency type of situation where you have to go in and do a laparoscopy and untwist it before it dies because a lack of oxygen to any part of the body can, uh, can kill the organ. Uh, uh, you can have that, you can have internal bleeding from a rupture cyst. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have infections, 
that type of thing. You don't see them as much in that age group. You see them more in a little bit older group. Okay, more the teenage The teenagers years. thing, yes. But I have seen young girls that I've done surgery on okay. that are very young. All right, and then speaking of the teenage <clears throat> years, what are some of the difficulties that females can interact with, or what are some of the different things that bother females in the teenage years? Uh, the usual things that I just mentioned, uh, problems with uh, ovulation, problems with uh, uh, pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. It's a common thing. Uh, there is an acceptable amount of pain that you can have with periods, and then you get into the non-acceptable pain, mm -hmm. those pains that can cause a, a girl uh, to not be able to go to school, yes. incapacitating type of pain, right. and then you have to start thinking of problems. One of the most common problems where you get uh, chronic pelvic pain, especially during the time of uh, periods, is something called endometriosis. Mm -hmm. That's when you have the endometrium, which comes out as the period, is growing in the wrong place. Okay. It can be growing in the walls of the uterus, or it can be growing in the pelvis most commonly, but it can be growing any place in the body. It's an unusual disease, and we don't know why it, some women get it. it. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, What causes endometriosis? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. It's most likely a genetic thing and it's most likely an immune problem mm -hmm. uh, because it is associated with other immune problems, autoimmune problems, like people that have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's, uh, thyroid autoimmune problems. So it's most likely related to that. Okay. So what kind of treatment is available for teenage girls who have this sort of problem? Well, the main thing that we worry about is the girl's fertility, mm -hmm. maintenance of fertility. Because if you ignore a girl that's having pain and it is secondary to endometriosis and you don't do anything, by the time they're in their 20s or 30s, they become infertile. Okay. So we do have to take that into account. So we're more aggressive in treating a young girl with pains, uh, pelvic pains, than we are with somebody that has already had their children mm -hmm. and doesn't desire any more children because then we don't have to worry about fertility. But in a young girl that still hasn't made up their mind whether they want to have babies, we do have to take that into account. I understand. So is there a way to remove the endometriosis without harming the fertility? Yes. Uh, the main thing we initially have the girl come in, we talk to her, and just by the history and the symptoms, we suspect that she may have endometriosis. And then we do an ultrasound, which also gives us some signs that may be pointing towards endometriosis. But the only way that we can diagnose endometriosis is by doing a procedure called a laparoscopy, mm -hmm. which you make a small incision about five, about a fourth of an inch, you put an instrument called a laparoscope and you put a camera on that and then we can see inside the pelvis. And, by, and then if we need to excise any of that, then we put an, an additional two other little incisions mm -hmm. and we put instruments through there and we excise things. Okay. Yeah. Is this an outpatient type of treatment? It's an outpatient treatment and once we have diagnosed the problem, once the, the patient comes back, then we give her options and they're mostly medical options to try and control the endometriosis. We cannot get rid of endometriosis, but we most certainly can control most of it, Okay. most of the time. All right, now some uh, signs or symptoms of a female who may have endometriosis. What's some things that they can look out for? Chronic pelvic pain, especially when they have the period, mm -hmm. uh, pain with the intercourse, excessive bleeding with clots, uh, cysts, Mm -hmm. Masses in the pelvis, uh, those are the most common complaints that they give. O also, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Okay. There, are, there are certain chemicals called prostaglandins that endometriosis makes, and those affect the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Okay, all right. That's interesting to know. I'm sure there's a lot of girls out there that are wanting to know this information and are tired of dealing with that pain. Definitely, you know, and, and the main thing is to come in as early as possible because then it allows us to help them and to avoid all these problems. Because not only do you have the pain, but you can't sleep the right way, you're constantly walking around with pain the whole day, so you're grouchy because you haven't slept, 
and you're grouchy because you're you kept pain. You just don't feel good. You don't feel good. I mean, I, I mean, if I don't sleep right, I'm, I'm going to be grouchy. Right. I'm going to not feeling right. Constant pain. I mean, you're just not relaxing. You're, no. you, you, you can't relax. No. So what's the difference between endometriosis and fibroids? Endometriosis is abnormally placed endometrium, mm -hmm. which is what comes out as the period. Mm -hmm. Fibroids are tumors of the muscle of the uterus. Okay. Those are solid tumors. And there's, uh, at the age of 40, 40% 40 of women have fibroids. So they're very common. Most of them are benign. Mm -hmm. If they're small and they're not bothering you, just ignore them. Uh, if they're growing very quickly, then you have to rule out something that may be malignant, something called sarcoma. And if they are misbehaving, you know, for what, whatever they're doing, either causing pain or causing infertility or causing a problem, then we have to also take them out. Okay. And how invasive is that? Well, it depends how big they are. Uh, we can also, most of the time, take care of them with the laparoscope. Oh, okay. If they're very large, uh, then we have to make an opening, a larger incision. Uh, there's a problem with very fast-growing tumors that may be cancer because then we have to use, a, if we're gonna use the laparoscope, we have to put a plastic bag through a small opening, put the specimen in there, and then try to take it out in small pieces, but within the bag. Okay. Because we don't want to break it up inside, and if it's cancer, it will go all over the abdomen. Okay. So we have to, be, uh, to recognize that, it, that there may be a possibility with that. All right. So that we avoid further problems. And so what's the difference between cysts and fibroids? Cysts are collections of fluid, like a balloon filled with water. Okay. There would be a cyst. All right. A fibroid is a solid, solid tumor. And usually cysts, you get them in the ovaries or you get them in the tubes, in areas. And, and fibroids, they usually come from the uterus itself. Okay. All right, so these are some things that may be happening in uh, younger years and maybe going in through your teenage years, your, your young female years. What's some things that some females may struggle with, maybe like in their 20s to 40s? It depends on whether the female has babies or not. Okay. Because once you put in the pregnancy factor into it, mm -hmm. you add on a whole bunch of other things that come into play. If the, if the female does not have a baby, well, it's just an extension of the teenage years dealing with abnormal bleeding, endometriosis, fibroids, uh, cysts, that type of thing. Once you get pregnant, then you add another big factor into the equation. And once you get pregnant, of course, uh, tissues, you have tissues that expand, mm -hmm. tissues that lose uh, their tension, and then you start having uh, the pelvic organs dropping, okay. uh, stretching of the ligaments, uh, stretching of the organs, uh, the uterus, the bladder. Uh, and if you uh, deliver by vaginal delivery, then you can have torn, the pelvic floor will tear, and then you start having hernia, hernias. Okay. And then you start having what we call prolapses or dropping of the bladder, dropping of the uterus, or dropping of the rectum. And then you have additional problems which can be incontinence because the bladder has dropped and you lose pressure in the urethra, which is the little tube that comes from the bladder to the outside. So when your bladder is full, you empty your, the bladder through the urethra. And if you lose pressure there or if it becomes hypermobile, then you will start having loss of urine, otherwise known as urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. no fun for anybody. Which is no fun for no. anybody at all, no. no. So have, getting pregnant and having a baby is great and wonderful and it's a full joy, but it could also lead to some problems yeah. within the body. So talk to me about some different things that will help treat some of these conditions that you just mentioned. If it's a minor thing with incontinence, we usually teach the, the patient to do what we call Kegel exercises. <clears throat> Kegel exercises are exercises of the pelvic floor. Uh, not the buttocks, not the thigh, not the abdomen, but the pelvic floor itself. And that will kind of strengthen the pelvic floor and prevent some of the incontinence. If that does not work, then we have to think about some additional surgery, 
to put pressure and stability to the urethra. And the way that we do that is by putting a ribbon underneath the urethra to increase the pressure or to stabilize it. And it's made out of a portion of mesh. And it's a, it's a thin ribbon, uh, probably no more than half an inch in size. And if the pelvic floor is torn, then we also have to repair the pelvic floor, push the pelvic organs up where they should be, mm -hmm. and then repair the pelvic floor. And if it's a large defect, then we have to start thinking of using additional products to help buttress the repair. It could be made out of animal tissue, or in my case, because I'm a specialist, they usually send me large defects, I use mesh. All right. And I'm sure that you've seen commercials on TV regarding mesh, mm -hmm. and that's what I use. Okay. And the only people using mesh right now are mostly urogynecologists. Most general gynecologists and urologists are no longer using mesh because of the problems that you can have with mesh. Okay, all right. So that's to help hold up organs. Talk to me about pelvic floor reconstruction. Pelvic floor reconstruction is, I'll, I just mentioned a little bit, and what happens is that when you have babies or even when you go through menopause, you lose estrogen, you have weak, weakening of the tissue. Mm -hmm. If you are overweight or you have any type of disease that will make you chronically increase your abdominal pressure, mm -hmm. like if you have asthma or coughing or allergies and you're coughing and putting pressure in the abdomen, they will transfer to the pelvic floor and they will weaken the pelvic floor. So even uh, paratroopers, female paratroopers have been known, there was an article written on how just because they're jumping out of planes and landing hard, they weaken the pelvic floor and they end up with incontinence. Okay. So what we do is again, uh, uh, reconstruct the pelvic floor, push the pelvic organs up where they should be mm -hmm. and reconstruct the pelvic floor and if needed, put additional products that will help the reconstruction. Okay. All right, that's fascinating. Lots of different ways to help somebody out. Yes. So let's talk about um, some things that might affect a woman later in life as well. Like we've talked about young, moving into getting pregnant, having the pregnant, some things that can happen. What about when you're in menopause and then further? Well, when you're in menopause and you get into menopause and by definition it's a year after your last period, mm -hmm. then you're no longer producing estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone is very helpful because it keeps uh, the tissue young and strong. And once you no longer have it, that's when women start having weakening of the pelvic floor tissues. And also side effects in the bladder, uh, frequency, urgency, uh, the bladder becoming spastic, and then you lose urine. So uh, this, the main big thing that happens in the females once they go through menopause. So the things that happen when you were young become more severe or aggravated when you go through menopause. Okay. And then of course the factor as we age, we uh, start getting into the problem with cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact of life, you know, that, that, you know that some of the uh, carcinogens that are in our environment, if you smoke, you're, you're going to increase your, your factors uh, by, I don't know, by hundreds of getting any type of cancer. Right. And then you start dealing with cancer of the uterus, cancer of the cervix, cancer of the ovaries, and that's another big thing that comes with age. Okay. Now, if a female has all of the organs removed as far as like a hysterectomy, do we still need to worry about cancer in that area of the body? Well, if, if you remove the uterus and the ovaries, most of the time you don't. But there's also a few times when there are what we call ovarian remnants uh, that remain and you can still get cancer. And even if you remove uh, the uterus and the ovaries and the tubes and you have endometriosis mm -hmm. and then you start taking hormone replacement therapy, you may wake up the endometriosis again. Oh, okay. So, so you have come to... Back. Yes, so you have to take th these things into account. So just because you had a hysterectomy and you had the ovaries taken out doesn't mean that you cannot have female problems. Okay. They, you can still have them. All right. Um, now, I have heard of something called a Mona Lisa procedure. Yes. 
The Mona Lisa procedure is a name specifically put there by a company uh, to name a procedure. Other different companies have like V-Lace, mm -hmm. uh, which comes from vaginal lasering. Uh, different names are given by each company that makes a laser. And what it is, is a laser treatment of the vaginas, specifically a carbon dioxide, CO2 laser treatment to the vagina. Uh, we started, I started using the laser when, in 1983. And it was mostly used for destruction of lesions. As time, as time came on, like in the uh, 90s, they combined the laser with the computer. And now they were able to fire the laser very quickly and at different densities. And slowly, slowly, it, it came into the uh, aesthetic market, the cosmetics market. And they started using the laser in the face for facial rejuvenation. So if you have wrinkles, if you have lesions, those can be treated with lasers. And what happens is that when you treat the, the, the skin with the laser, you heat the collagen mm -hmm. and you get new collagen and you can get rid of wrinkles. So the same thing happened a couple of years ago. They started treating the vaginal tissue and lo and behold, we get the same type of effect. We get increased collagen, we get uh, lo uh, more elasticity, mm -hmm. we get more moisture because now you have new vessels are getting built. So women that are having problems with intercourse are now able to have intercourse mm -hmm. because before it was so tight, there was no elasticity, there was no moisture. Now with the treatment of the CO2 laser, they now can enjoy intercourse, uh, having sex again. Yeah. Well, that's something that I'm sure a lot of people are looking to find out right there. Yeah, especially women that have had breast cancer yeah. or have had clots, they cannot use estrogen. If, you, if you're after menopause, the most common thing is to use estrogen so that you can have vaginal rejuvenation. But those women specifically, they cannot use estrogen, then we have the option of using the CO2 laser. Okay. Well, we've talked about a lot of different things and that you treat, the conditions. Does somebody need a referral to see a urogynecologist? No. If you have a problem with uh, incontinence or you have a problem with prolapses, you can self-refer yourself. You say, okay, well, then there's not that many of us. I'm the only urogynecologist in the whole central state of Illinois. Oh, okay. There's not even a urogynecologist in Champaign-Urbana or Terre Haute. So I'm the only one in Western Indiana and Central Illinois that oh. has been trained in, in this subspecialty. All right, that's good to know as well. And we just have a couple of minutes left and you mentioned earlier that you treat the whole entire pelvic floor. So if someone is having some intestinal issues, what would make them think about coming to a urogynecologist such as yourself instead of a gastro? Usually they go to a gastroenterologist. Okay. And if they cannot find anything, they usually they are referred to me. Because if it's a gastrointestinal thing, they usually think, well, gastroenterology, mm -hmm. first of all. Mm -hmm. But if, it's, if, they don't, can, if they have a colonoscopy, they can't find anything, and they still have uh, nausea, vomiting around the time of the period, mm -hmm. then they should start thinking that the patient may have endometriosis. If it's a cyclical type of uh, symptom that they get, then you start thinking about a hormonal issue. Okay. And that's when they start referring me patients. Okay. And at the beginning when we started talking, you said, I see girls ages 10 to 12 all the way up through their 90s. And you said, that's what I see for the most part. Do you treat men? No, I don't treat men. Uh, I, I do other cosmetic things. Mm -hmm. So I could treat like liposuction, that type oh, okay. of thing. But that's, okay. uh, that's an added thing that I do. Right. Uh, but usually I don't treat men. You know, if it's a the husband of, uh, of one of my patients, it's, it's an emergency, and they say, well, you know, my husband has this. Right. I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll bring him in. I'll, I can, and I also so do some dermatology, you know, and so I get referrals for excision of facial things, tumors, okay. and that type of thing, so I do treatment. You do treatment for it, other for, things. For other things, but, but not for That's another topic for another day. It's another right. topic for another thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, this yes. has been very interesting and I'm sure very educational for a lot of women out there and young girls. So thank you so much for coming in today. Well, thank you it's been for a inviting pleasure me. talking about and this. And if anybody with you. has any questions, please call the office and I'll be happy to talk to anybody. 
All right. And we thank you for watching this episode of Being Well, and we'll see you next time. Production of Being Well is made possible in part by HSHS St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital, delivering compassionate care close to home. From advanced surgical techniques and testing to convenient care for your family, we promise to make a healthy difference each and every day. St. Anthony's, together we are better. Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Rediscover Paris. Our patient care and investments in medical technology show our ongoing commitment to the communities of East Central Illinois. Paris Community Hospital Family Medical Center.